Welcome to Cash Plays, and now your host, Bart Hansen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cash Plays. I am Bart Hansen, coming to you from the dungeon that is Foxwoods. Of course, you can email me at cashplays at pokerroad.com, and you can also leave voicemails at 877-836-ROAD. And again, I know I haven't played any voicemails, but that's because I'm from a remote location. I will promise you that I will play some next week. Um, I had a lot of emails uh, complimenting the show last week, um, of course, with uh, Neiman Simoleus. Um, some people saying that it was it was by far the best show and the best poker interview they'd ever heard, and I want to thank everybody. Um, some very, very good information was given out. Um, in fact, I got an email here from Troy Tucker. He says, uh, I've been a listener to you as far back as Live of the Bike, and I've heard all of your episodes of Poker Road Radio. However, until now, I have never once felt compelled to write into a show. This is exactly the type of show that I am interested in. I was always under the impression Simoleus was very guarded and reclusive. Hats off for getting him to share so much information. I'm a Card Runners and Stocks Poker member and can honestly say the content in your interview with Simoleus blows away any individual piece either has ever produced, including CTS videos. Well, thank you for those kind words, Troy Tucker. Um, again, I don't necessarily know if it was to that extent, but, um, yeah, we, uh, definitely got some, some very, very good information from, uh, Somalia. So if anybody missed last week's show, I want to encourage them to, to go back, uh, and click on the link there. And of course we are in iTunes. So if you have not subscribed to the show, you can just subscribe to cash plays or do a search on poker road and, uh, get every single week's uh, episode a little right into your iTunes. Uh, today we're going to have on the show uh, Francis Cipriano, and uh, people here know him as Fran at Foxwoods. He's a guy that uh, Simoleus says is the best live player he has ever played with. Um, if anybody plays regularly on the East Coast, you've seen him. He usually buys in and covers the table. Um, very prevalent here at Foxwoods. Uh, has been playing for a few years, so we're going to have a pretty extensive conversation with him today. Um, as again, I think that you know, bringing guests on the show when I have the opportunity really adds some flavor. As far as what I've been doing um, this week, um, I actually got into the Foxwoods main event. They have something that's called an Act Three, which is like a like a mega satellite, and uh, I got in and I made it to the middle of day two, and unfortunately, uh, I was knocked out. Just really couldn't, you know, win any big pots, couldn't hit any sets or anything like that. Um, Hoyt Corkins made a pretty big call on me in a hand. But I ended up swapping 5% with a couple of buddies, and one of my buddies uh, cashed. So ended up getting back the money from my uh, my mega satellite. So so that was good. The trip in itself, in terms of the cash games for me, now it's been about two weeks, has been pretty eventful. I actually won, I had the single-handedly uh, biggest day that I've ever had no limit hold'em, uh, ten and a quarter, uh, no limit hold'em. I had uh, I think it was about a twelve thousand dollar day, and there were three big big hands that I had, and I want to go over a couple of them because uh, there's you don't really see the second hand that I played every day. The first hand, you know, I usually start off with uh, about I think I was starting off with about three thousand or thirty five hundred. And I had kind of, I was down on the trip. I was actually stuck about six or seven grand, so I wasn't feeling too peachy. But I, I raised it up with aces, and we were playing five hand, and a guy called me, and the board came out ten seven three rainbow, you know. And I bet the flop, and he raised me, um, and I was like, oh no, not this again, you know. He raised the flop, and I was actually thinking, you know, I didn't know the guy. He he looked like he had played relatively tight. I thought it was a little bit weak just to fold, you know, there. So I called and I was going to reevaluate the turn. The turn brought an ace, and actually, as a reflex, I checked. I was just, you know, it's it's a mistake that I commonly make. Like I, I have it in my mind that I'm always going to check the turn, and then I, you know, a card comes that I totally do not expect, giving me top set. And again, as a reflex, I checked the turn. 
I'm not sure if I had it to think over again if I would have, you know, made a kind of a weak lead. Um, you know, guy's not going to put me on top set there. To my dismay, the guy tanked on the turn and checked behind. You know, the river was a was a blank, and I ended up shoving. Luckily for me, the pot had been built up so much when he raised a thousand on the flop that I shoved seventeen hundred into a two thousand dollar pot. You know, it's thirty seven or thirty eight hundred, seventeen hundred for him to call, and he called, and he tanked, and he called. So I'm assuming that he had a hand like ten seven. Uh, I think it was ten seven three. I, I just I, I can't imagine any other hand that he could call me with on the river there. Maybe a set, maybe bottom set. You know, maybe a set of threes. Anyways, he tanked and he called. That set me on my way. I doubled through to 6,000. Then this other guy comes down. He sits at the table. New, he sits down with 5,000. And this was probably the most incredible hand I've played in a long, long time. Gets limped around. I'm in the small blind with ace four diamonds. And I complete. Uh, he's in the big blind, this guy who just sat down for 5,000. He checks. The board comes out queen, jack, three with two diamonds. So I've got the nut flush draw. I lead for $75, which is within the pot. The guy makes it 275 in the big blind. The other guy folds. I just call. Now the pot's like, you know, 600. The turn is the five of diamonds. Queen, three, five, three diamonds, and the jack. Queen, jack, five, three. I now lead at the guy for 500. He thinks about it for four or five seconds, and he ships it in. And I couldn't even believe it because what he did was he took his stacks of chips and he started moving them forward like in a slow manner. And they didn't cross like the betting line. Like they have these lines on the table that are called betting lines here. I don't even know if they enforce the rule. So I asked the dealer, I'm like, is he all in? Is he all in? And the dealer was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, I call. Um, Obviously with the nut flush, I've never, like I said, at that level, I mean, I bet 500. The guy ships in for 4,500. He didn't show his hand. Uh, I'm assuming that he had some other flush, and he couldn't imagine I had the nut flush. But um, got the most action there. Um, and then, you know, I, I won another pot later on in the session where it was kind of in a tough spot where I had moved to a new table, and a guy had raised it up under the gun. Now I would called with pocket sixes, and a very, very tight player behind me who had about 3,000. He called. And the board came out 965. And the under the gun raiser made a, a hefty bet, like like a pot size bet, like he had an overpair. Bet, you know, four or 500. I made it 1200 with middle set. And the guy behind me ships for 3000. So I was like, wow. You know, there was no flush draw out there. 965. I ended up getting, you know, if I were to make the call, I ended up getting a little over two to one from the pot. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've got equity, obviously, if the guy has seven, eight, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm slightly behind. If he turns over seven, eight, you know, the pot might just not warrant a call. But you've got to put the guy in a range of hands. I'm crushed if he has top set. But, of course, he could have bottom set. Now, I thought that there was more of a chance that he had top set than bottom set because he kind of instantly shipped. And I thought that playing pocket fives like that would kind of be an overplay. But I, but I remember what uh, Neiman had told me, Simoleus off the table, that with t- guys that play very, very few hands, tight, tight players, and this is what you've got to remember when you're in a spot with a very, very tight player like this and you flopped what you think could be the best hand, which is usually a very strong hand like a set. Very tight players think sets are the nuts. You know, tight players, they don't play in pots often. A lot of players are tight bad. So whenever they're going to flop a set, you know, they're going to put it in there. So there is a very good chance or, or, you know, definitely a chance that a guy could have a lower set than you. You know, you, you know, you might think, well, would a guy overplay a set like that on a straight board? Well, tight players, yes. Um, so I thought with the equity I get from 7-8, with the chances that he could have pocket fives, getting two, two and a half to one from the pot, it warranted a call, and I did call, and he actually ended up having bottom set. I had quadded on the turn anyways, caught a six on the turn, so it didn't matter. But um, in that case, if I had flopped bottom set there, I think that that's really the cutoff point when, you know, you're a flat caller pre-flop, 
and a guy who was represented in over pair of leads and you raise with a hand that should be probably, you know, more than one pair, like let's say on a straight board, and a, a tight player behind you now makes a three bet. Bottom set there, I think, is a fold. I was talking to some people about it. Because it, with bottom set, you don't beat much. Um, you know, would that guy really make a move, move with a three bet with top two after you raised in between? Probably not. Bottom set, I think you fold on a straight board when you see a lot of heat in that case. Middle set, because you can beat bottom set and because you have equity against, you know, a straight, I think it has to be a call. It's interesting, though, because if you play deeper, you know, you're not going to shove all your money and you've got to massage the pot and figure out where you're at. But it was a very interesting hand. Um, and again, I ended up winning a ton of money for that day. So, um, you know, I was happy. I took a shot in 150, 300. Uh, OE game, and I got slaughtered. Um, and it's not because of bad play. If anybody knows about split pot games, and I'm actually going to introduce uh, Pot Limit 8 or better on the show today because a lot of people asked about it. Um, sometimes a guy who doesn't know how to play Omaha 8 or better or stud 8 or better can actually bet you out of the pot when it's not proper. If anyone, um, you know, I'll give this example for people that play Omaha 8 or better. This was limit 150, 300. I had limped call to raise with ace 3 of diamonds, 8, 6, which isn't a great hand. And the board had come out ace, jack, 3, and I played it pretty conservatively. I think I might have check called the flop. I had no real low draw, and I had a, a bad aces up. There was one diamond on the board. The turn brought a second diamond, but it was a low card. I think it was, uh, I want to say, a 7. So now the board's ace, three, jack, seven with two diamonds. I've got aces up, which may be good right now for high. It might not be. And the nut diamond draw, but now a low comes in. And I'm pretty much out of position. And now the blind comes out and leads on the turn, which happened to be men the master. And I know how he plays. He, he's got the nut low in that spot. I call. A guy to my left raises, and this donkey makes it three bets. And I cannot call three bets to chase half that pot there. Um, you know, I've got to call two big bets cold on the turn when I'm chasing half the pot when my full house draw might not be good. And, you know, someone can obviously have diamond blockers. So I ended up folding. And, of course, you know, call, call, and then, and then the diamond comes in on the river, and I would have won half of a pretty big pot. And the guy that had done the three bet on the turn, again, for people who know Omaha 8 or better, raised the turn... And he was the pre-flop raiser, and he bet the flop with ace, king, king, six. Again, the board was ace, three, jack. Turn was a seven. He had ace, king, king, six with the king high flush draw. No low, mind you, except a live six draw, which is just terrible. And ace, king for high with the king high flush draw, and the diamond comes in, I would have won extra bets from him, but it was totally unwarranted for him to make that three bet. But he's, of course, part of the game. I mean, the mixed games out here are absolutely amazing. 75, 50, uh, OE, and um, HOE. You know, I wanted to concentrate on a lot of no limit, but, you know, I, I enjoy the mixed games, and in L.A., you don't see mixed games at that level. And usually they're thrown in with draw games like Deuce to Seven Badoogie, which I'm not, you know, a superstar at. So, uh, I, you know, I took the opportunity to play in a lot of these mixed games. Uh, unfortunately for me, I, in this particular case, I didn't win a pot and I ended up losing about five or six grand. But, um, you know, what's what is, you know, very very interesting is the fact that there are four or five spots in some of these games. Four or five players, they have no business playing in a 20-40 game. When you're at that level, it's pretty rare to see. I don't normally see it in L.A., but I've seen it here in the Borgata in Connecticut where they're just, the game, the mix game is just juicy as hell. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's just too juicy to pass up. Um, but on that note, I want to kind of do an introduction about Pot Limit Omaha 8 or better because people have been emailing me and they're kind of intrigued about what I've talked about over the last few weeks. And this is a game that I've been playing online. Now, I haven't played that much this week because obviously I've been here, but I'm going to continue to play on Full Tilt and Stars. And again, you can usually see me between 3 and 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, Pacific time. My name is live at Bike Bart on Poker Stars, 
and live BK Bart on, uh, or live at Bike Bart on Full Tilt. So it's live, live BK Bart on Poker Stars and live at Bike Bart on Full Tilt or something like that. You'll see the names. But uh, anyways, um, you know, it's a big bet game. So, of course, position is important. Um, you know, I ran across a website that said that Pot Limit Omaha 8 or Better is an and game. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? What the hell is an and game? And I went on to read it, and it said, you have to have the nut low or the nut low draw and a good high hand. So when you're making the transition between limit and pot limit, 8 or better, you have to realize that you routinely must fold nut one-way hands. In limit eight or better, you know, I've got ace, king, queen, deuce, and the board comes out, well, seven, six, three. Well, I've got the nut low, and I can improve with high with a king or a queen. But in pot limit, Omaha, eight or better, I really can't stay in there. I have no high. Somebody could be on a total free roll against my ace, deuce. Um, and the biggest part of this game is three-quartering. And again, for people who aren't familiar with high-low split, three-quartering is when you tie for half the pot, say like you tie with the nut low, but you lose the high to someone else. Well, in limit, it's not that big of a deal. You get three-quartered, you might lose a few bucks, but in a big bet game like pot limit, it becomes a big deal. If you stick your $400 stack in there on a 2-4 game and someone, and you get three-quartered, uh, you know, you're going to be losing you know, in that case, hundreds of dollars. Um, so you definitely have to be wary of being three-quartered. And that's why PLO 8 or better is an and game. You have to have the nut low and what. Now, normally my cutoff is I like to have the nut low in an overpair or I like to have the nut low in a, in a very nice draw like the nut flush draw. You're going to get it in there. Um, nut low top pair, top kicker is a hand that you can build the pot up with as well. But you've got to have both sides, and it's got to usually be the nut low and a fairly strong high hand to start building a pot up. The other interesting thing about PLO 8 or better is that when you flop wheels, you sometimes have to fold them too. Because if the board comes off 3, 4, 5, and you have a naked ace deuce, and there's a couple of clubs out there, well, yeah, you have the nut low, and you think to yourself, well, I have a high hand too. I have, I have a straight. But anybody else that has ace deuce there in that spot can be on a total free roll for high with a flush draw. Or if somebody has ace deuce and a six high straight or a higher straight. And that's also the other interesting, th interesting part about this game. When you're looking for pre-flop hand selections, a six is a pretty important card. You know, you wouldn't think a six would be an important card in a high-low game, but it is because you can three-quarter wheel boards versus other people that just have naked wheels. If I have ace, deuce, five, six, and the board comes out three, four, five, well, I have a wheel plus a six high straight, whereas someone just an ace, deuce, I'm going to three-quarter them. We're going to tie the low, and I'm going to win the high. Um, you know... Say the board comes out, you know, uh, I'll give you another example. Um, four, let's see here, deuce, deuce four, five. And you have ace three, six. Again, you've got a wheel. You've got ace three for net low, but now you have a six high straight. So you can see how a six in your hand can really help to three-quarter someone. Now, in terms of pre-flop starting hands, you know, one of the things I've learned is, is that naked ace deuce hands without high possibilities and what's without suited nut flush hands are really garbage from up front. You don't, you actually want to be folding ace deuce jack nine off suit. I mean, those are hands that just don't play well in this game because remember, it's a big bet game. And if you flop the nut low, you really aren't going to have a high and people can jam you. You know, Pot Limit Omaha 8 or better is about flopping just monster, monster hands, flopping home runs and building pots up. Um, when I was playing earlier this morning, you know, I had ace, deuce, five, six, and the board came out deuce, uh, three, four, five. I think I actually had ace, deuce, six, seven. That's a home run hand. That's a hand I'm going to start building a pot up with. 
not low and not high. Um, you don't really want to be making a lot of moves in pot limit Omaha either better, with one exception. You know, if a board comes out and there's a couple people in the hand and you have position and it's checked to you, a lot of times you can make a half pot bet and just take it down, regardless of what the board is. People don't seem interested in the hand. Um, that's the one case in pot limit Omaha eight or better where you can make a steal where, you know, if you are in position, the value of position is you can just kind of bet on a board that people don't seem interested in. But if you're out of position, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. You can play more hands in pot limit Omaha eight or better than you can in limit eight or better. The deuce three hand has some value. Uh, in limit eight or better, it's kind of junk. It's a junky hand. It's a trap hand. But in Omaha eight or better, if you have deuce three locked up, and let's say a guy raised with you know ace ace uh, seven five, okay, and the board comes out ace five. Ace five eight. Well, and this is one of the common, most common things in in Omaha eight or better. He has to actually shut down. And you see guys put their entire stack in there with top set of aces, but he has no low. You are on a free roll with just deuce three with just a wheel draw. There's no way that this guy can win a low. But he seems like, you know, he's he, you know to himself he feels really strong because he's got three aces. I've seen it so many times where someone will actually put their entire stack in. Let's say they don't even have any low cards, ace, ace, jack, ten, which isn't a great hand in, in eight or better. Put their entire stack in on, on an ace board with two low cards. Well, you just can't do that, and that's what the power of deuce three is, because if you have deuce three and an ace flops, somebody will give you action with three aces, as opposed to if you had an ace, deuce, or an ace three, and you flopped the obvious, not low. So that's really the power of deuce three in that game, um, and especially if you can get in there with like a smooth deuce three, four, five, Again, deuce three, four, six, deuce three, five, six, something like that, um, where you've got uncounterfeitable low, and you can tag a guy who's only raising preflop. That's another thing too. If you can use Omaha Tracker with poker ace the heads up display, um, preflop raising is such a key statistic in this game because if you're looking at a guy who's played thousands of hands and he only raises preflop two or three percent of the time, he always has aces. So if an ace flops with low cards. You know that he has aces, but he might not have a low, and you can just jam him on a total free roll. Um, high hands are tricky in this game, too. And I'm not going to profess to be you know, a total expert, because I've gotten burned in some high hands. You know, If you're playing like a queen, queen, jack, ten, double suited, which is playable, and the board comes out queen, five, three with two diamonds and two clubs, you cannot jam the pot. Because you are actually behind in equity versus a low draw and a flush draw or a low draw and a wrap draw, an ace-deuce-four type hand. With your high set hands, when two low cards flop and you flop a high set, you absolutely have to wait until the turn to put in more money. Um, so be wary of high hands. I'd actually you know, suggest people who don't have much experience with the game just to stay away from the high hands. And again, people jumping in, Look for home runs. Ask yourself when you're playing a hand, what do I have and what do I have? Okay, I've got the nut low and I have the nut flush with overcards. Well, great. Great hand. But there's another hand where I've got the nut low and I've got bottom pair. Well, that's not a great hand. You Maybe you can call a bet and try to spike two pair, but you're looking for a better high hand. So if you call the flop for one bet with the nut low and middle pair, and now another overcard comes, and now a guy makes a pot size bet again, well, maybe you want to get out. Um, again, you are looking for home runs. You're looking for two-way hands. And I will um, definitely you know, talk about this more on later shows. Um, and if you have any specific questions about PLO 8 or better uh, at the pot limit level, Again, cash plays at pokerroad.com. Um, I hope that that has, uh, you know, started some of you off that haven't had much experience with the game. Um, and again, you can call in 877-863-ROAD. Uh, and we will be back with Fran right around the corner. So stick around right here on Cash Plays. Cash Plays. Previously on Big Poker Sundays. This internet stuff just isn't stopping. I think that people are just trying to fabricate controversies at this the point. Internet just, they have something to talk on. about. 
That's the thing with the internet. It's always on. No one ever turns it off. Don't they ever have to reboot the internet? <laughs> Seriously, though, it goes forever. What do you know that goes on forever? The internet never stops. The TV stations, usually they, they have a shutdown. The picture goes out. Solar flares. Yeah, when is it? When is the solar internet? Solar flares. Yeah, yeah the satellite. color bars. The solar, color bars. Yeah, no, the solar the satellite. If you have satellite, oh, right, yeah. there's a certain time of year where you can't watch. Watch it where the picture, though, because of the solar flares. Right. The internet just goes on for If the internet goes on your house, you steal someone else's internet off their wireless. That's all you have to do. I've been, I've been on the, I'm just thinking, I've been on the internet every day for the last 10 years. I should probably quit the internet. <laughs> do that. I'm waiting for it to go out so I can just be like, oh, yeah, no more internet for a while. For more with Bob and Huff, tune in to Big Poker Sundays every Sunday. Only on PokerRoad.com. Cash Plays. And welcome back, everybody, to Cash Plays. Uh, today's guest is Fran, Francis Cipriano. People know him as Fran here at Foxwoods. Uh, welcome to the show, Fran. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show is because last week, Neiman, of course, Simoleus, uh, talked about how he thought you were the best live player that he's ever seen. Now, he hasn't played that much live, but... You know, I respect his opinion, so I wanted to have you on the show. So, again, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Um, now, Fran, you know, you live here in Connecticut, if I'm correct, right? Yep. So you're, you know, kind of, you know, an East Coast player. Tell us a little bit about how, how you came up and how much poker you play, like, right now. Well, um, I'm 42 years old, so I, I played a lot of poker when I was uh, – in my 20s and 30s, uh, but it wasn't no limit. Um, I played a lot of local games, and it was mostly uh, limit uh, forms of high-low, mostly Omaha stud. And um, and then you know, I got when I got when I got married and had children, I stopped playing for a while. I, w I wasn't. It was just uh, uh, I wasn't doing that full time. It was just recreational playing. And then um, I uh, I'm a real estate developer, so I bought a, a piece of property about five years ago and um it turns out uh one of the tenants that was in my building is a fellow by the name of uh manny texera and um uh he um had a lot of no limit experience and he played with uh phil Locke and antonio asfendiari in uh, the city um when those guys were just starting out and uh so uh you know just talking to manny i started getting into hold em. And um, I started out playing um, Limit at Foxwoods just for about six months. And um, I really didn't enjoy it too much because of, uh, you know, the running down and, and uh, you know, not being able to protect your hand, all that stuff. So Because Manny was mostly a no-limit player. So um, then I started playing. They, had, they used to have a 5-5 no-limit game here at Foxwoods with uh, no cap. And it was a great game. And that's kind of where I learned. And... Um, you know, so most of my experience was with deep stack. I would always buy in uh, a little bit heavier. Um, and um, through speaking with Manny, and then um, I met Neiman here, um, uh, I'm going to say maybe about six months after I started playing, I met Neiman and we became friends. And, um, you know, just uh, I, I think there's no doubt my development as a player was sped up uh, because of the fact that, I had those two guys at my disposal, and um, you know uh, I really appreciate Neiman paying me that compliment. Uh, and uh, you know I hope he didn't uh, put too much on my back by saying something <laughs> like that. But uh, now that five-five game that you talked about, I remember when I actually used to play when I when I would go home over Christmas. There was a, a buddy of mine that used to run a home game, and they would always talk about the five-five uncapped game at Foxwoods. That was the biggest game that was here, right? That No Limit started off when it first started, yeah. right? Yeah, I think before I think before that, before I started coming here, I think that it was originally Pot Limit, uh -huh. and then it changed to No Limit, and it was um, I um, I can't remember, but I I do believe they had like a they had smaller games, one two maybe or something like that. But five-five was the biggest one, and what would happen? During the tournaments at that time, then they would they would get a ten twenty five game off, which was still really big for at that time, you know. And uh, the five five game was crazy though. I mean, there people would be sitting down with ten, twelve, fifteen thousand in a five five game. You know, if you know how to play, you're gonna. 
you know, and, and that's one of the, you know, the other reasons why, you know, I wanted you to come on the show because we had an interesting conversation with Neiman Somalius last week. And I've played with you a handful of times, usually in 10 and a quarter. And the thing that I've noticed about your play is that normally you have just about everybody covered at the table. Now, Neiman said some very, very interesting things about deep stack play last week. Um, specifically, he said that if you can't make big laydowns, and he was talking about probably set over set 500 big blinds deep, then you have no business playing that deep. So I wanted you to comment on that. And maybe take us through maybe a hand that you've played in the last couple of years where you had to make a big lay down because you were playing so deep. Um, well, I think, um, you know, when you're playing that deep, uh, you know, it, it, everything is so player dependent, but uh, you're playing a lot more pot control. I think, you know, especially when you're against hyper-aggressive players, you always want to, especially and out of position too, you don't want to get yourself in situations where, you know, uh, uh, you blow up the pot out of position against a real aggressive player when you're that deep because, you know, there's, there's, it's all about putting yourself in the right spot, I think. And um, as a matter of fact, on this trip I made a, uh, had to make a pretty big lay down to Neiman, in fact. Uh, um, I laid down a set of kings. And um, it just, I, I, we know each other's play so well. And um, uh, I'll give you how the hand played out. Sure, go um, ahead. We were playing, um, in, ironically, it was, a, it was a shorthanded game, but we had we'd been on a long session. We were both over, up over 24 hours. And um, it was uh, 10 25. And uh, it was me, him, and two other regulars at Foxwoods. And Neiman and I both had about uh, 25,000 on the table. And. Um, uh the uh the person under the gun mucked i believe it was four-handed person under the gun mucked and the button made it uh 75 and i was in the small blind with kings and um i just decided to call because neiman had been raising so much and i thought maybe he might pop it there you know and uh unfortunately he just called so uh the flop comes down king queen 10 with two diamonds and um i let out um, I bet uh, 150 into 225, and Neiman made it uh, 500. And, um, you know, he's so difficult to play against out of position. I got in a bad spot with him in November playing a hand like this out of position. And I blew the pot up, and, uh, and I ended up getting lucky on the river on him. So I didn't want to make the same mistake in this game. With the, with the draw out there, and there's already a made hand out there, I decided to just call. I call, and the turn is a seven of hearts. And uh, I check, and he bet the pot, 1100 And uh, I call again, and uh, the river uh, was the four of diamonds completing the flush. And I check, and he bet the pot again, 2800 And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, we just know each other so well. I know he's not bluffing me there. Everything hit, and, uh, you know, I was lucky enough that he showed me his hand. He made the nut flush on me, and... Uh, you know, we discuss the hand later, and, you know, if I repop him at any point in the hand, he's not going anywhere. He's just going to make more money, you mm -hmm. know, and that, that's a perfect example of, of that situation where, you know, a lot of players, you know, uh, I mean, like I said, everything's player dependent. We know each other's game so well, and, you know, it would be a lot harder to make that type of lay down to a stranger. But, uh, you know, in these deep stack games, that's where, uh, that's where you're going to make your money on big decisions like that. Making a big lay down and being correct about it is uh, the same as uh, winning a pot, you know? You know, one of the other things, too, um, you know, we do emails. People email on this show. And uh, there, was, there was an email here from a, a guy named Edward from Victoria, British Columbia. And he asked me about a game that he plays in Canada where... The blinds are 1-2, but the effective stacks are $3,000. We always talk a, talk a lot about pre-flop equity situations, um, you know, and I talk about, you know, I will call with small pocket pairs if I can make 10 times the raise size. But when you're playing so deep, at what point can't you do that? You know, if you're playing $25,000 deep and another guy's got $25,000 and, you know, a guy opens to 400 and another guy re-raises to 1700 you know, you're going to get 10 times with pocket threes, but do you start bleeding money away when you make big calls pre-flop? Um, I, I don't, I don't, 
there's so much because when, when if a game is playing that aggressively, you know, you're 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 going to make ten times if the guy has a real hand. If there's a lot of re-raising mm-hmm. like that, you know, there's uh, no guarantee that he's going to have that type of hand. And um, again, it really you know gets to be player specific. And you know, when we're playing ten twenty five here, and somebody's sitting that deep. You know, usually we always know who the players are. And um, you know, if you see a total stranger come in. You know, you might want to take, uh, you know, again, you're going to know if you're a decent player, you're going to know within 20 minutes or so, you know, what type of player the guy is. And uh, I, I think that for the most part, um, you know, there's now that a lot of the Internet players are coming into the cash arena, you know, that's that's where, um, you know, they're going to be transitioning from that hundred big blind structure into mm-hmm. this deep stack stuff. So. You know they're going to have a, a, a growing pains, and there's going to be another experimental stage that they're going to go through finding their way in this uh, 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 deep stack arena. But I noticed that a lot of the internet players that come out um, that I end up playing against, I see, in my opinion, they're they're making big mistakes in these in deep stack because of uh, they're used to that structure, and they, I it mostly it involves blowing the pot up. You know. Uh, uh, when it shouldn't be in overplaying hands and, you know, so, uh, you know, to follow along with that, you know, I saw last night cause I was going to bring up exactly what you just brought up. You know, when you see a young kid with a lot of money, you, you've almost got to figure him if you haven't seen him playing here, that he's made a bunch of money online. Mm-hmm. You were playing a twenty five fifty game last night. And I think Jason Strasso was in the game in seat five, which yep. a lot of the, you know, listeners know, how do you adjust to these guys and do you see them making th- these these fundamental errors when they're used to playing, what, like you said, like a hundred big blinds deep? Um, well, Jason, um, Jason's a tough player to play against, and uh, you know, uh, without giving away too much, it's it, you know a lot of this, a lot of the no limit, it's it's all. You know, you have to be very image conscious. You know, you have to be aware of how they're viewing you and. You know how you think they that they that you view them, mm-hmm. and um, you know I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty uh, comfortable where my image is with everybody, and uh, you know I kind of know the way everybody feels about my play, and I just just base it off that. But you know Jason's uh, one of those guys. He's uh, he's very aggressive, and uh, you know you 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 just have to be, always be on your toes when you're in a pot with him, and. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, with guys like him, it's pot control. You know, you just got to try and control the size of the pot. And, you know, you, you want to blow it up when you feel it's the right time, you know. You know, and let's talk about pot control. And I also want to bring up a concept that I brought up in the first part of the show about being way ahead and being way behind. That concept on the turn when, say, you know, you make a raise with ace-king and the board comes out king-high and you make a flop bet and it gets called. And let's just happen to say that the guy doesn't have a draw, he's got king-10. Well, you're way ahead there, and maybe you bet again on the turn and he folds. But if you check the turn, you might get a river call as well. Just can, can you, you know, when, do you, when you're playing that deep with one pair of hands, do you err towards checking the turn on non-draw heavy boards for pot control and because you might be way ahead or way behind? Um, you know, that that again, I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty comfortable in saying that any good no limit player is going to always tell you the answer is it depends mm-hmm. because it depends right. on the player and the situation and um you know if you got a guy who's uh who's uh you know very aggressive I'm probably going to um you know if I'm out of position I'm probably going to check the turn to him and see what he does depending uh-huh. on if there's a big draw on the board or not and uh you know how how where is he mentally in the game is he winning is he losing you know there's so many factors it's it's hard to give just a, a concrete answer right. there and um uh uh but you know without mentioning any names there was a there was a real uh, aggressive player in the game last night who was sitting pretty deep he had 30 40,000 on the table and um you know, he's one of those guys, he's, you know, he's in there betting, you know, he's in there calling pre-flop raises with, you know, king three, king four, queen eight, you know, so a guy like that, you know, if you want to get max value, you know, you're probably better off betting those, con- continually betting those hands because, uh, you know, he's he's just calling, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If it's the guy that's going to, a guy like Jason who's going to constantly put heat on you, 
you know, you got to play pot control with those type hands and just pick your spots when you when you have a big hand to try and blow up the pot. Um, you know, another thing that that came to my mind as well, and I know again the answer is probably going to depend that it depends, but you know, can you when you're four betting within a hand? And I'm not talking about pre-flop, but somewhere in the hand where you throw out a bet, you know, somebody raises, another guy re-raises and you four bet or however it goes down and you're that deep. You know, can you ever not, for, can you ever four bet without the nuts? I guess is what my question is when you're playing so deep. Um, geez, that, that situation, I haven't seen that come up that many times in a live game deep Um even in you know hands I'm not involved in, I'm uh-huh. just trying to think of a situation. Um, it would, you know, it would. Uh, I guess maybe it could be a, uh, you know, a straight flush draw against. I, I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. I really can't think of a situation like that. There was a hand um, uh, at the Commerce that I heard about when I was out there uh, for the LA Poker Classic. Um, uh, involving uh, two of the regulars out there, and it was a twenty forty game, and um, uh, they were both very deep. Uh, one guy had thirty one thousand, the other guy had sixty thousand, and um, the fella who had sixty thousand was a regular out there and pretty tricky, aggressive player. And I guess he raised it up under the gun, and there were three or four callers, and um, um, uh, the guy on the button with 31000 I believe, was Sean Chaconis, and uh, he called um, the $200 bet. And I think the original raiser was Juan from the Commerce. Uh, everybody pretty much knows him. Yeah, and just, um, uh... and uh, the flop came down five, six, seven of spades. And uh, uh, Sean had three, four of spades. And Juan, who was the original raiser under the gun, raised with eight, nine of spades. Wow, that's and, unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and all the money didn't go in. It, all the crazy betting didn't start happening until the river. And um, so, you know, Juan's the type of guy who can make some pretty big bluffs, and Sean mm-hmm. knows that. And, you know, when one guy has a straight flush, the other guy has a straight flush, it's going to end up bloody for somebody. Wow. And uh, so there's a situation where there were – you know, I mean, that's a lot of big blinds deep. I know yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it, it would take an unusual circumstance to answer your question where there's right. that much betting, you know, without the nuts. Well, or, well, let's talk about, you know, maybe four betting is a little unrealistic in a situation where it doesn't usually happen. But let's just talk about three betting. I actually saw a hand that you played in. I think I was in the game where uh, a board had come out. I think it was, I want to say it was queen, ten, blank, and... I think he got checked around the flop, and the turn was a king. And you had a jack nine, and a guy who had not raised preflop had an ace jack. And you bet out, and he raised you, and you oh. three bet, and you folded to a four bet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, when you're playing that deep, what, are you three betting for information, or if you have a big draw – you're not going to three bet because you don't want to get yourself pounded away from it. Yeah, I remember the hand. I believe it was um, it was an unraised pot, uh-huh. and um, the guy would the guy was very tight. He was an unknown to me. I, I haven't played with that guy before, and um, uh, I just uh, you know I had trouble with the hand because I I it was unraised and I just I didn't think that. Uh, you know, I three bet him because I, I was I was kind of finding it hard to believe he wasn't going to raise the button with Ace Jack. Right, you know? right. And um, uh, so when he, you know, when he when he came back over the top of me at that point, it's just math, and I'm just calling for a chop at best. And right. I, you know, I was pretty certain that the guy guy had Ace Jack in order to do that. And luckily, he turned over his cards and showed it. Right, you know, I right. was right. So, um, um, you know. Those situations, it's it's usually you know the nuts when it happens like that. You know, I guess my point is you're never probably going to three bet there with a set. Say the board flop had been checked around, and now all of a sudden you turn a set. Not necessarily that hand because it would have been a, a very strange hand with a set of kings, but now you lead, and now a guy raises you, and now you have a draw, right? If a straight is out there, so I wouldn't expect you to be three betting there, right, in that spot. Um. Say that again. I'm sorry. I was, was, was going to say, like, say you had turned a set in that hand or you had turned some sort of hand yep. where you could improve on the river. Yep. Now, jack nine versus ace jack on that board, you're not going to be able to obviously improve. 
I guess the, what I'm trying to get at is when you're playing that deep, you're not going to put in a third bet to no. blow yourself off that draw. No, because, uh, you know, again, it, especially, um, you know, it goes back to Doyle's book there, the unraised pots. You don't want to mm -hmm. get, you know, you don't want to go broke in an unraised pot like that. And, um, you know, when it's, when it's unraised, you know, anybody could have that any two cards and there's that many people seeing the flop. You know, usually somebody who's uh, raising like that is not messing around, you know. It's not wise to 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 go ahead and repop them there when, you know, I would just call with a set and see what happens, you know. Let's switch gears a little bit here, and this is kind of a, the great poker road radio debate. A lot of people have given a lot of shit to Joe Seabach because he talked about how East Coast players suck uh, last year <laughs> when he was here. And um, I saw you at the LAPC. Um this February, and I've always said on my shows that I, I think fundamentally the games in L.A. are the toughest. When I came and played the No Limit here, I feel that it's a little bit softer. How do you think Borgata, Foxwoods, East Coast um, stacks up to, to Vegas and L.A.? Well, they're definitely two, two, there's definitely a stark difference between the, the style of play mm -hmm. in the East Coast and the West Coast. And um, it just seems, you know, the games here, Foxwoods, Borgata, um, you know, there's a, it seems there's a lot more people waiting around for the nuts to make the nuts. And the games just play a lot more passively, I think. Um, there's, you know, out at, out at the Commerce there, I mean, it's, there's a lot of, there's plenty more all-ins there than you see here. Really? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I I just, you know, they're they're much more aggressive out there, and uh, you know, uh, guys here, you know, with you know top pair like type hands or uh, you know bottom two pair hands, they just they don't go nuts with them here. Mm -hmm. um, I I just uh, and the other thing is too the the buy-ins um, out in Vegas in the commerce, the minimum buy-ins are 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 much lower right. in no limit games than right. here. Um at Foxwoods and Borgata, the minimum buy in's usually a hundred big blinds. So in the ten ten twenty five game the minimum buy in's twenty five hundred. Right. Whereas at the commerce in the ten twenty game the minimum buy in's only six hundred dollars. And the twenty forty is only two thousand. Twenty forty is only two thousand. Right. If right. that game were here it would be four thousand, you right. know? So I think um I think, you know, that's why people people are obviously they're buying in shorter, they're gambling it up more and um I think you have to be more versatile to play out in the West Coast. You know, um, there's definitely two differences. Uh, uh, the first time I went to the Commerce, um, you know, it was an adjustment for me. But I, but I did well out there. I think my game, um, my game for some reason or another is, is even though I play mostly on the East Coast, uh, it seems like on the West Coast, uh, my game is more suited for that style, that style of game out there. I want to ask you another strategy question before we get into a couple emails. Um, recently, I had a debate with a buddy of mine, um, and we were talking about the concept of betting to protect a hand. Because he says that that's kind of you know, a bad concept, betting to protect your hands. He says that you should always be betting for value or as a bluff. And I'll give you an example of a hand where, say, a guy had raised it up pre-flop and you smooth called with pocket tens in position. And the board came out queen 5-4. And he bet from up front, standard continuation bet. And you decide to call in position because you thought that there was a very good chance that you still might be good. Now the turn comes a deuce, something like that. It might com complete a weak, weak draw that you might have. So you've got tens on a queen 5-4 board. Do you check the turn there? And again, I understand that there's possibility that it's going to say it depends, but... Do you think that there is value in betting to protect against ace king where you're giving a free card up when you're checking the turn or do you have showdown value enough where you can check the turn? So you're saying you're saying I'm in position he checks it to me on the, on the turn. turn, right? Um Yeah, it depends on the player. If it's um you know, if it's somebody tricky uh like uh you know, Samo, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, he you know, if I make a bet there, you know, obviously I'm, uh, you know, I'm gone if I if I get raised, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, I, I'm not I'm not against betting there. It depend it has to depend on the player. But uh, um, if it's like the guy who was playing in the twenty five fifty game last night that I mentioned, who's uh, 
who's, uh, you know, playing all these weak hands, I'm definitely betting against him, you mm -hmm. know. Um, if it's somebody who's uh, very aggressive and I want to get the showdown with him, um, you know, I'm probably going to let him take one off and just uh, see what happens on the river. You now, know? you're betting against that wacky guy for, for value for on value. the turn? For, for value. value. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think about the concept of betting to protect against cards that can beat you on the river um, in no limit? Well, you know, again, it, it depends on the player, and, you know, it's all about picking your spots. I mean, uh, you know, I have to be really confident in in, in, in my read on the guy that and, and feeling that I'm ahead because, um, you know, there's there's just so many good spots in these games to get lots of money, and um, I... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look to mushroom the pot there. You know, ten uh, queen five four deuce with tens. I mean, you know, any six, any three comes, any ace comes, any king comes. You know, uh, he's gonna he's gonna put. You know, you're gonna be in a position where you're gonna have to make a thin call. You know, and uh, so uh, that's like a pot control issue, I think. You know. Okay. Uh, let's get into a couple emails. And again, you can email us at cashplays at pokero dot com. Cashplays at pokero dot com. Appreciate everybody that's been uh, emailing in. And this first email comes from Brent Kun, And he says, I thought you could discuss the value of bottom two pair on a fairly connected board. I seem to be overvaluing these hands in many situations. Um, friend, one of the reasons why I picked this e email out is because this is a hand that I struggle with sometimes from in the blinds. When I get a free ride, you know, and I've completed with like a hand like six, seven in the small, or I get a free ride in the big with five, four. And the board comes out connected probably with at least a two suit. Like I've got five four and the board comes out five four six or five four seven, something like that. You know, what do you think the best way to kinda you know, in a multi way pot to play that hand from up front? Uh, you know, depending on how many players are in the hand, I mean that's obviously a, a dangerous situation there and there's you know, the I think, um, you know, I'm definitely betting and, um, you know, you, it's a spot again for pot control. You don't want to blow up the pot. You got to be very careful with a hand like that. Cause there's so many cards that could come to ruin your hand and, you know, you just don't want to get that much money. And I mean, if I, uh, you know, it'd have to be, uh, a, a feel for the, who the players are in the game, how the game is playing, how many people see the flop. And it's just something that I think it's a situation where you have to deal with it very carefully. And, uh, you know, um, if you're going to proceed, uh, if you if you bet out and you get raised, or uh, there, it's always a sticky situation on what's going to happen on the turn. You know, Th depending on which cards come, how far you want to go in that spot. I mean, again, it's an unraised pot. You know, there's so much unpredictability involved in an unraised pot when you have a hand like that. It's so vulnerable. You know, so you just have to proceed with caution and. Uh, be be very careful. You got to know your opponents there too. You know. I think one of the things that I struggle with in a hand like that is, I, you know, my style is not normally to check raise, and you know, normally I, I lead out there. But you know, I, I find myself when I lead and say that there's four or five players in the hand, and it's a very dry board. You know, am I almost giving them the odds to call for a draw as opposed to if I checked them and somebody bets, I can blow them off the pot. At the same time, when I make a check raise, I'm bloating the pot big out of position when there's any number of cards that, that can come where yeah. I don't know where I'm going to be at on the turn. I mean, I don't think, I don't think I'd ever be check raising there in an unraised pot. You know, I think for sure I'm leading out and, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to like it too much if I get raised either. You know, it's going to be very, very player dependent on whether I proceed or not. So, um, uh, you know, I'm leading out and then I'm just going to, you know, it's all, this is one of the things that, um, you know, you asking me these questions, this is a, a one of the, the reasons uh, uh, that I've benefited so much from having Neiman as a friend. Mm -hmm. um, what Neiman is so good at, he's so good at articulating these situations. And for me, as a player, um, uh, I know what I would do in the situation. I'm more of a feel player and it's, mm -hmm. it's not as easy for me to verbalize everything like it is with Neiman. I mean, Neiman is such a bright guy, and that's how I've been. Um, I've been very lucky to benefit from his friendship because um, I, I I know what questions to ask, and he just puts the answers into into uh, words that are so you know understandable. And it's like when he gives me the answer, it's like what I that's what I'm feeling. 
but it's not as easy for me to verbalize it. So I don't want you to get confused if I'm giving you an answer that you I think, don't know how to I, deal with. I think you're but, giving a great answer. I, to follow along with that, do you think that check raising on a board like that is actually maybe overplaying the hand? Yeah, yeah. No, I would never check raise with a hand uh -huh. like that. Never. Um, interesting. Leads us into a, our next email from Brian Carpenter from Detroit, Michigan. He says, hey, Bart, I love the show. I have a question for you regarding check raising in cash games. When exactly is it proper time to check raise? Could you possibly go over a few scenarios with varying position chip, fat, chip stacks and flops and then talk about how big check raise bets should be as rule of thumb? Thanks a lot. Keep up the good work. You know, it's interesting. I see a lot of times in these internet games when they're playing 100 big blinds deep that people will commonly check raise with draws, two-way draws, trying to take the line where there's maximum fold equity, maybe against a one hair, a one pair hand. When you're playing as deep as you normally do, when do you find yourself check raising a flop? Like in, in what scenarios? You know, I'm starting to think here. You're getting, <laughs> you're getting very personal with these questions. You know, uh, I don't know how much I want to give away here. And and for all you guys that are listening at Foxwoods now, when I have bottom two on that four, five, six board, you might be getting check raised. So watch out. <laughs> but um, hypothetically, know, yeah, hypothetically, hypothetical. um, yeah. You know, it, those situations. It's you know, it's it's you know, it's all about. Uh, you know, as Neiman would say, it's all about frequencies and balancing ranges and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the check, the, when I'm going to use a check raise on, on certain flops, it's going to be a function of the guy's stack size and um, how, how, how I want to get the money in if I have a big hand on the flop. You know, uh, um, I, I, I really don't want to get too specific there, um, but, you know, uh, certain... Uh, let, me, let, yeah, me, I, let me throw out a couple of examples for you. If if you wanted to build a pot up with a nut hand, is that a spot where you where you may check raise in certain situations? Um, it depends because, uh, you know, it depends how. I mean, sometimes we're so deep in these hands. Uh -huh. It's you know we're so deep. It it's like you know a lot of times when um, when you have the nuts out there and you're you know you're. You definitely want to build a pot, but it's uh, the players that are very good that are playing very deep. You got to be, you know, you got to be able to disguise your bet sizes because, uh, you know, uh, they're so good. If like, let's say you flopped a nut flush, and uh, you know, you're so deep, and you know, if you're making a bet that's going to tell him that you have the nut flush. You know, some of these guys are, you know, they, they might just call you look, hoping the board pairs and look to make a big bomb bet on, the, you know, put you to a big decision on the river. So um, it, it, you always have to be, I'm just going to say that it's it's always a function of bet sizing, patterns, frequencies, hand ranges. You just you just have to, you can't do anything the same in this game when you're playing against all good players. You know, it almost reminds me of, of a PLO type situation when you're playing so deep in hold'em. What I mean by that is... When you're when you're, you know, a thousand big blinds deep, well, the nuts change right on later streets. Absolutely, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not going to happen as much in Hold'em as right. it is in PLO, but um, you know, uh, uh, that's what it is. You know, when I'm playing against tough characters like Neiman and you know any 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 one of these tough players, it's uh, it's. It, it, it's very tough to let them know what your hand is and be wide open to one or two more cards to come. You know, I mean, you 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 have to balance the issues of wanting to build a pot and uh, and not totally revealing the full strength of your hand so that they can maybe um, uh, take advantage of your vulnerability later on if uh, you know a lot of scare cards come. You know, I'm going to ask you uh, one more question, Fran, before I let you go. And again, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I want to follow up on something that Neiman Simoli said last week uh, regarding deep play. Um, he wasn't doing a lot of three betting when I had played with him pre-flop throughout the week. And, and, and the reason why he said that last week was because, you know, when you're playing so deep, he wanted to see flops. So I guess my question to you is, where is the line when you have a big, pair or in some case what you think is the best hand pre-flop where's the line where you're just going to call when you're playing deep to see the flop and where you lose some value when you might not make a re-raise with like a hand like aces kings queens maybe an ace king suited against a very loose player 
Um, again, that that's a that's a balancing question. You know, you want to. Uh, I I I am I agree totally with Neiman in, in this in the uh, 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 area of uh, seeing as many flops as possible. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the way I like to play because um, I feel that. Um, uh, most of the time, the players I'm playing against, I feel confident enough to know that uh, I'm going to make better decisions against them. And um, I think uh, um, seeing more flops and, and letting the hands play out more, um, you know, it just puts them to make tougher, makes them make tougher decisions down the road. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's pot controlling, too when you're also seeing more flops because now you know like you like you said the cards you know that they're the board is constantly changing so you know it's um i i think in order to exploit the players that are out there for me it's about seeing flops i want to play as many hands see as many flops so i'm not doing a lot of uh um uh uh three betting and four betting pre-flop uh because of that and um you know it when they when people see you just uh calling a raise with aces or just calling a raise with kings instead of re-raising you know you're that's how you're keeping them off balance so um uh you know that's all i really want to say when it comes to that issue there i don't want to give away too much you know all right well fran you did give away a lot and i appreciate it and uh good luck everybody can you know you're one of the regulars here at foxwood you usually wearing the sunglasses and the and the bose headphones right uh, I, you know, I just started with the headphones because uh, <laughs> lately there's been a you know a lot of banter at the a table. A lot of loud I'd, I'd rather I'd rather just uh, go into my Fra- own little Fra- world. Frankie Flowers. <laughs> yeah. uh, Frankie's a piece of work. <laughs> well, Fran, again, thanks a lot for coming on the show, and uh, that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, we will see you next week, and I will most likely be in Los Angeles. There's an off chance I may be at the Bellagio, but I'm not sure. Um, again, you know, I was contacted by the people at Stocks Poker. I'd love to have Leather Ass on the show, um, and hopefully we can make that happen. So look for that in the near future. That's a, an online name. For him. Yeah, the guy's name's Dusty. <laughs> so uh, we will see you next week. Thank you, Bart. Bye.